This 10 day itinerary covers four locations throughout Japan, Tokyo, Mount Fuji, Kyoto, and Osaka. It is great for first timers in Japan looking for a mix of modern city life, scenic nature, remnants of traditional Japan, delicious food, and some good times. In this video, we will share how we planned out our travels, including our accommodations, transportation, favorite food, and activities in each city. We tried to be as efficient as possible with our route with as little time lost to backtracking as possible. Our route started in Tokyo and worked south, renting a car to drive to a small town near the base of Mount Fuji and utilizing the great train network to travel down to Kyoto and Osaka. If you're traveling to Japan from the Western Hemisphere, you will lose a day on the way out. Don't worry, you'll get it back on the way home, but you will have a day zero travel day. Here we go. There are two airports to choose from when flying into Tokyo, Haneda or Narita. Most travelers prefer Haneda, but it's not worth breaking the bank over if flights are better or cheaper to NRT. When you arrive in Tokyo, the best and cheapest way to get into the city is by train. The fastest way is by taxi, but it can be around $100 for a journey compared to a relatively cheap train ticket. Haneda is about 30 minutes from Tokyo Central Station and NRT is about an hour. Choosing where to stay in Tokyo is overwhelming as there are so many different neighborhoods and so many hotel options in each neighborhood. Most people choose to stay in Shinjuku or Shibuya, but as long as you're near one of the main subway lines, you'll be able to get around and see everything you want pretty easily. In general, hotels in Tokyo are super expensive, so it's a great city to use hotel points if you have them. We used ours at the Aloft Hotel in Ginza. It was a great location and met all of our needs. By the time we landed, we were pretty tired and jet lagged, but our excitement for authentic ramen powered us through the evening. We stayed in the area near our hotel and waited in line for about 20 minutes to try this Michelin guided ramen at Kagari. They made the bib gourmand list for this silky golden chicken ramen that was out of this world good. The simplicity and richness of the flavors was mind blowing and exactly the dinner we were looking for before some much needed sleep. The next morning we took a 20 minute metro ride on the Asakusa line from Ginza to Asakusa. Hat Coffee is known for their 2D and 3D latte art. When you walk in you can show them any inspo picture and they'll make your latte right in front of you. It's super personalized and they even have a phone stand so you can record the process. It isn't quick and the queue builds up, so make sure that you get a reservation. Once caffeinated, we headed across the street to the Sensoji Temple and enjoyed the beautiful views and shopping. However, this area is crowded and you can't really move faster or slower than the general flow of people, so come mentally prepared for that. To escape the crowds, we popped into this little restaurant to try something we were really excited about standing sushi. It was delicious and so affordable compared to prices in the US. It was so fun to just order whatever we wanted and have it instantly placed in front of us. Every great day starts with coffee. The good news for any of you iced latte girlies is that iced coffee is big in Japan. The bad news is that most coffee shops don't open until 10 a.m. or even noon, so you're going to have to delay that coffee intake. If you're like me and you can't make it that long, 7-Eleven is a great place to pick up a latte and some breakfast snacks. Banjin Coffee was easily my favorite coffee in all of Tokyo. Once it opens at 10, expect to wait about 30, 45 minutes in line because it's just one man behind the bar taking his time to craft the perfect beverage. And if you didn't know, Tokyo is the city of lines. So uh, there are very small places and there's a lot of people usually waiting for restaurants and coffee shops. They have a selection of Japanese lattes and I tried both the matcha latte and the green tea latte. Both were well worth the wait. And I'm ready. After getting the caffeine in the old bloodstream, we headed off to Happy Pancake to get Japanese souffle pancakes. They have a few different locations around Tokyo and their pancakes are so light and so fluffy. If you love pancakes, you have to check this place out. So happy, got happy pancakes. While in Shibuya, spend some time watching all the nice folks cross Shibuya Crossing. There's an insane amount of people that cross the streets here at one time, and we enjoyed people watching and filming way more than we thought we would. This was my favorite sushi belt conveyor restaurant in all of Tokyo. Located on the upper floor of a department building, this place was tough to find and also was very popular. Do not wait until you are very hungry to try to go eat, because it will not end well. <laughs> the line moved fast, and the sushi was out of this world. I did have some problems knowing when to stop grabbing plates though, so make sure to come hungry. After all that food, we needed some new activities. If you love all things gaming and electronics, you have to check out Akihabara. We spent an evening playing arcade games and trying our luck with the capsule toy machines. I want this guy. Let's see what I get. I also tried to keep up with this local man, and apparently I have the reflexes of a toddler. 
Day four was our last full day in Tokyo and we felt like we had to check out Team Lab Planets after seeing all the Trini Instagram videos. This interactive art museum was insane and even had everything from a floating flower garden to a wild room which they called a soft black hole. We paid around 25 US dollars per person and it was so much fun, we highly recommend it. Tickets will sell out months in advance so make sure you book ahead of time. Make sure to wear shorts. The water is high in some areas and others where mirrors will make everything visible. You know what I mean? There is a 0% chance this is a flattering angle. All the exploring left us pretty hungry. Near Team Lab Planets is one of the best markets in Tokyo to try a variety of fresh local Japanese food, Skichi Outer Market. We made an entire video about this place, so if you are interested, make sure to watch that video. Get there early as it is crowded and closes in the afternoon. We knew we wanted to spend some time outside of the big cities and enjoy the countryside of Japan. We decided to rent a car and drive to Lake Kawaguchiko, a town near Mount Fuji. We reserved a rental car online through Toyota Rent-A-Car. The process was pretty straightforward. I don't know if I understood a word he said. I mean, it looks like a car. There's no charger in here. In Japan, you are required to have an international driver's license. In the United States, this can be purchased at a AAA. I recommend that you book a car that includes an ETC card. This will allow you to drive on the toll roads rather than stopping at every toll booth along the way. Also, consider rental car insurance because you never know. The views along the car ride were stunning and we had so much fun talking, eating local Japanese convenience store food, and taking taking photos of Mount Fuji. I did have to remind myself that you drive on the left side of the road and I kept mixing up the blinker with the windshield wipers. We stayed at Fuji Kawaguchiko Onsen Hotel. This ryokan is a traditional Japanese inn located on Lake Kawaguchiko with stunning views of Mount Fuji. Ryokans typically have tatami matted rooms and onsen, which is a communal bath, and include traditional Japanese meals. We spent the day wearing traditional Japanese clothing, relaxing at the onsen, and taking in all the views Mount Fuji had to offer. The ryokan included a traditional Japanese dinner and the main course had seven dishes. It was delicious and with full stomachs we slept like babies on the tatami mats. We made a full YouTube video about our trip to Mount Fuji and staying at the ryokan. If you want to learn more about this experience click this video link. Day six was a travel day. In the morning we drove the rental car back to Tokyo and then took an uber over to Tokyo station to board our bullet train to Kyoto. While at Tokyo station we had to grab Ekiben for the train ride. Ekiben is a box lunch that is sold at train stations to enjoy during the train ride and there are so many options to choose from. Lauren's picking out our mystery bento box for the train ride. I don't know what any of it is. It's all Japanese. Taking trains and public transportation is a breeze in Japan, and it was enjoyable to take in the countryside and relax. The train ride was about 2 hours and 15 minutes, and we reserved our tickets ahead of time online, and they costed about 130 US dollars per person. This included luggage storage as well as an assigned seat. We will leave a link in the description to book the bullet train from Tokyo Station to Kyoto Station. Arriving at Kyoto Station, we took a taxi to our hotel, the Chapter Kyoto. We chose this hotel to utilize Marriott points and it was also located within walking distance to nearby subway stations. For dinner we stumbled upon this Yakiniku restaurant and ate so much food. After dinner we burned some calories and walked over to Yasaka Shrine and learned how to pay respects at a Japanese shrine. We packed in as much as possible for our first full day in Kyoto. Starting the day off early we took a taxi to Fushimi Inari Shrine and arrived at 7.30 in the morning. Fushimi Inari is dedicated to the Shinto god of rice, Inari, and this is supposed to be one of the most important shrines for that god. Fushimi Inari has free admission and has hiking trails that take you to the mountain summit. Seems like a lot of people don't hike all the way up, so a lot of people stop halfway, so I would say don't worry about taking your pictures down below, just keep going, get up top, and it's beautiful. And you have it much more to yourself. Look. Nice. The gates are so big, it's almost hard to describe like how large they are until you see them up close in person. After Fushimi and Nari, we headed to Ninenzaka Street, which is a great area to visit to see traditional Japanese architecture, eat some delicious food, and do some shopping. We highly recommend you eat at Masaichi, where you can eat delicious Japanese food on traditional tatami mats. <laughs> All right, we just finished lunch. We're headed to Kiyomizu Dera, and it's about a 10 minute walk from here. So let's go. A Buddhist temple and UNESCO World Heritage Site 
well known for its wooden stage and Otowa waterfall. The Oto Waterfall has three streams of sacred water thought to bring love, success, and longevity. The entrance fee to Kiyomizadira is about 400 yen per person. Lorna and I always try to book a cooking class when we are in a new country. This is a fun date night for us as we learn how to cook traditional meals. We booked a class at Ramen Factory Kyoto and it costs us about 120 US dollars per person. We had so much fun making our own noodles, creating our own broth, and making fun of each other's cooking skills. Day eight, we woke up early to see the bamboo forest. We hopped in a taxi to get there as quick as possible in order to beat the crowds. It was about a 30 minute journey from our hotel and we arrived around 7.15 a.m. Some of the bamboo stalks are 90 feet tall. Waking up early paid off. There's only a few people here at the bamboo forest and it is just beautiful walking through here, hearing the birds chirping and just seeing how tall these bamboo stalks are. It's incredible. We got there at like 7.15 and it was about perfect, but we're leaving, it's about 8 a.m. now and it's already pretty packed. So I feel like a lot of people are gonna be upset that they didn't get here earlier. After the bamboo forest, we headed to Nishiki Market and arrived as they were setting up. Highly recommend you visit here to try a variety of Japanese Japanese foods at a good price. Most vendors allow you to order small amounts of just about anything. My personal favorite was this juicy chicken thigh roll. It was so good and the soy sauce flavor hit the spot. This place gets packed so make sure you get there earlier rather than later to beat the rush. I would recommend around 10 30 or 11 a.m. We created a full two-part Kyoto travel guide series. If you're interested, click here for part one or here for part two. We grabbed our bags and headed to the train station to take the Kihan main line from Sanjo Station towards Osaka. This was a short one hour train ride and we opted for the premium car that allowed advanced reserve seating because we wanted to ensure we would have room for our luggage. This train was very nice, however, it was a very short ride and there were no restrooms on the train. Arriving in Osaka, we walked to the Courtyard Marriott Hotel, which is where we stayed. And that evening, we headed out for a food tour in Osaka. I had so much fun trying the different foods, but honestly, next time we'll opt for a DIY food tour, and it didn't seem worth paying the extra money to have a tour guide. While in Osaka, we had to visit Super Nintendo World at Universal Studios. Lauren and I had a blast trying all the foods at Kinopio's Cafe, doing VR Mario Kart racing, and interacting with all of the park's features. We went out of our comfort zone and rode the flying dinosaur at Jurassic Park. It was very intense. All in all, this was a great day and we had so much fun acting like a kid again. Just as a note, the park is accessible by Osaka's subway system and is very easy to get to. To cap off the evening, we enjoyed Japanese curry at Spice 32. It was delicious. Day 10, we went to the airport and flew to Seoul, South Korea. If this video was helpful, please like and subscribe and follow along with our travels. We will see you in the next video.